So we're going into the Christmas season. We're launching our Christmas season on Thanksgiving weekend. It's kind of fun. There's two camps of people, I believe, uh, that are all about Christmas. There's one camp that's like, hey, you got to get through the Thanksgiving meal and the turkey and all that. And then on Friday, Christmas begins, right? You get the Black Friday shopping. You do the presents. Or not the presents. You do the... Uh, the decorations, right, and all that stuff, and that's, that's wonderful. That's one camp of people. And by the way, you're going to vote on this in just a minute to see which one you are. That's, you know, it starts after Thanksgiving. And then there's the other camp of people that it's like Christmas starts after Halloween. Okay, we get done with Halloween. It's like we better go. We better start decorating and da-da-da-da-da. So let's see by show of hand which camp you're in. How many of you are like Christmas starts uh, after Halloween? You're just like, yeah, we're there. Ooh, look at that. That's a lot of people. And then... And that's great. You can put your, I know you're so excited. You just put your hand. And then the rest of you, how many of you are like, it starts, you know, at the original time, the right time. The per, yeah, okay. So one of those things. We know that Christmas brings out all kinds of emotions, whether it starts on November 1st or the day after Thanksgiving. Um, it brings out all kinds of emotions and things in us. We're going to do another participation here. Kids. We got a lot of kids as family worship. We love having the kids in with us to worship with us. This is a gift. Isn't it great to have a church full of kids? How about a round of applause for our kids? This is great. We love it. So kids, on a scale of one to ten, one being like, oh, Christmas stinks. I hate it. It's boring. It's terrible. Or ten, Christmas is wonderful. I don't have to go to school. I can eat whatever I want. I get presents. Okay. I want, I'm going to count to three, and you're going to give your number. And you can do anything between one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten's the highest, one's the worst. Ready, kids? Count to three. You can say your number when I get done. One, two, three. That's a lot of tens. That's good. That's good. Okay, now let's go with the parents. Kids, look at your mom and dad. See what their answer is going to be. Right? <laughs> now, you got to be honest. You're in church. You can't lie. Okay. If you had to gauge it, one being you're not excited at all, and 10 being you're like, I just can't wait. It's the greatest day. Da, 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 da. Okay, we're going to count to three, and everyone's going to say their number honestly. Okay? Ready, parents? Here we go. One, two, three. I heard a lot of sevens. <laughs> we're pretty excited because we're supposed to. My wife will kill me if I don't. All right. So we got a lot of things going on in the next 30 days, 30 some odd days, right? We got, we got kids events, we got Christmas parties, we got the shopping, we got the wrapping, we got the travel, we got to prepare for the house guests to come over, all of that. It's all wonderful, but it can feel a little bit overwhelming. You might relate to the great theologians Clark and Ellen Griswold from Christmas Vacation whenever they said these words. I don't know what to say except it's Christmas and, say the last four words with me, and... We're all in misery. We can relate to that a little bit. Hopefully that's not the case. We're going to try to find Christmas, not in the presents and the wrapping and the family and the perfect, all that, but in the scripture, the way that God intended it. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. If you have your Bibles, go there. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Kids, I'm going to need your help with some of these big words. They're hard to pronounce. and I'm not quite sure how to say them, so I need you to help me if you could. Ready? In those days, Caesar... August, we'll take it. Augustus, Augustus, we don't know. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first sentence, census that took place while... Kids, you want to take a stab at that one? <laughs> Pretty good. Our education system is working. Quirinius, nice job. He was the governor of Syria, and everyone went to register in their hometown. Now, what's really interesting about this is we still do this today. Every 10 years, we have a census. The idea is you try to figure out how many people are living in the state, and then within the state, how many are living in within a specific district, and then the government uses those numbers to determine how much funding needs to be sent to have the, you know, the things in place to help the people, blah, 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 blah. That's what they were doing there. It's also a good way to know how much you can tax people, because if you have more people, you can tax more. But anyway, that's what they were doing. And what was interesting is, verse 4, Joseph was a part of this, Joseph and Mary, that were going to have Jesus. Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. So what happened was, Wherever you grew up, so if you grew up in Bloomington, Illinois, you would go back to Bloomington, Illinois. If you grew up in Chicago, you'd go back to Chicago. This is Joseph. He grew up in Bethlehem, so he had to go back to Bethlehem. Now, how far was Nazareth 
to Bethlehem. Does anybody know? Let me ask it differently. I didn't ask that right, so I, I made a mistake. How long did it take Joseph and Mary to get from Nazareth to Bethlehem? Does anybody know? Take a guess. I'll give you a higher or lower number. Seven days is less than that. Three days is absolute. You good job. You win free coffee in the uh, which is free for everybody. But for, for anyway, you got it. Three days. Now, how many of you are going to be traveling for Christmas? Raise your hand if you're going to be traveling. You're going to be in the car. So I'm going to talk about the car. Okay. How many of you are traveling for more than two hours? Okay. That's how many of you. You guys might win. Um, I already know. How many of you are going to be traveling for more than six hours? There you go. How many of you are going to be traveling for more than twelve hours? That's a long time to travel. Um, in the first service, one kid put his hand up. They're driving to Georgia, and it was 11 hours of drive time, but probably they were factoring 15 hours with stops, and the kids got in a major argument about that. In the, in the middle of the service, we almost had a problem. But the idea is, it's a long way to go, okay? Um, we have always traveled for Christmas, ever since I was a kid. My my dad's parents passed away whenever he was little. He was in high school and college. My mom's parents lived in southern Illinois. We'd always travel for Christmas to her side or my dad's family who was still around in, in uh, way southern Missouri. And, and we just always traveled for Christmas. And we had all kinds of funny stories about traveling. I've got the best story ever, worst story ever. It's like the best worst story. And I, I want to see if anybody can top this, okay? So Rochelle and I, one year, we had the two kids. They were like six and four. We had our dog, and we traveled to Southern Illinois. We took the dog with us. Major mistake. But we went. We did it. We were, and it had gone well. And we were on the way back. We stopped about an hour and 45 minutes out. We are in Champaign. And um, we stopped at a Casey's. And Rochelle's like, I'm going to go in. I'm going to get the kids sodas, some pizza, some candy. We're going to get him back in. You take the dog for a walk. If he has to go to the bathroom, he can do that. Well, that seemed like a good idea because whoever was stopped at the Casey's in the grassy area before us did the same thing, and our dog saw that dog's dog poop and rolled in it. <laughs> yeah. So here I am with the dog with dog poop all over its back and shoulders, and, and I was so mad at that dog. And I thought, I gotta get, I gotta fix this. What are we gonna do? So I took it right back to the to the van, and I was thinking, what are we gonna do? And I noticed. There's windshield wiper fluid at most gas stations. You know what that is? So I just, I took that out and I was squeegeeing him, trying to like feverishly get this dog poop off. And Rochelle walked out and was not a happy camper. He's like, what did you do? I'm like, it wasn't my fault. He just rolled. It was just, it was, it was so bad. I had to sit in the back of the van with the dog, with the windows open so we could, because it just smelled so bad. Top that for Christmas uh, travel story. Actually, I can top it in the Bible. Um, Joseph and Mary traveled three days. She was about ready to give birth. Ladies, does that sound like fun? Uh, and they went there. So they went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Verse 6, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. He, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So imagine you do this three-day journey, and it's pretty miserable for this poor lady, Mary. And Joseph is just in a mess, and they finally get there, and there's no place. And he comes back, and he says, hey, I got good news and bad news. The bad news is we don't have a place to stay. And the good news is we can sleep with the animals tonight. And I wonder if that's when she started labor, right? I mean, it was just kind of like, ah, this has got to be terrible. And yet, in the midst of this craziness and unpredictable experience that had to be painful and difficult and all of the emotions, God was there. God was there. And he was announcing this arrival of Jesus in a spectacular way. Verse 8 of Luke chapter 2. It says that there were shepherds. And I want you to say the rest of that sentence until it gets to the comma with me, okay? And there were shepherds, say it with me, living out in the fields nearby. Where do the shepherds live? Out in the fields nearby. Did they have a home? They did not. Their home was a hillside. 
And because they lived outside with animals, they smelled. And because they lived outside with animals and smelled, they weren't welcome in their culture and society of that day. In fact, they weren't even allowed to come to church. If you saw a shepherd, you'd go the other way because they were the bottom rung of the societal ladder of that day. And yet, when Jesus was born, who gets to hear about it first? The shepherds. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Now, those poor guys, they're just, it's a nice, quiet night, right? The moon's shining, we got the stars, the campfire's still going. They're just about ready to nod off to sleep. And all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord, say the next few words, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, which would have been enough of a crazy thing. But then it says, the glory of the Lord, say the next three words, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were absolutely, say that last word, terrified. They're like, well, what's going on? So the angel of the Lord appeared to them would have been really fascinating in and of itself because they didn't think they were worthy. They didn't think they measured up. They'd been told they didn't measure up. You're not worthy of being a part of a relationship with God. But God's like, no, I'm, I'm pursuing you. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, which means there was nowhere they could go without being in God's presence. It's kind of like um, this stage right here. If I look straight up, and I don't very often, otherwise I'll be blinded. There's three bulbs that are blaring right on my face. If I look this way, up in that direction, I won't do it. It'll blind me because there's, there's these lights. We have to have the lights a certain way so it'll appear good on the table, all this nonsense. But it's just the way it is, but you can't get away from it. You can't get away from it. You can't get away from God. When he shows up in your life, uh, he's going to be there. And you're going to have to decide what you're going to do with that. The angel said to them, verse 10, uh, don't be afraid because they were obviously terrified. But then he said uh, these words, and I want you to say the ones that are bolded with me. Ready? I bring you. That's not all that exciting the way you said that. Let's try again, please. I bring you good news that will cause for all the there you go good job you got it you got it there's a lot of gifts that we're going to get this year none of them will compare to the gift of christ none it is good news it will cause great joy and it will be for all the people so let's have a little fun with this um what's the best christmas gift you've ever received Maybe just turn to your neighbor or friend and just say, here's what it is. Maybe it was a bike when you were a kid. Maybe it was last year you got the PlayStation. Maybe you got a car. Maybe you got a, I don't know, whatever it would be. Let me tell you the best gift that I have ever received, okay? Rochelle and I were newly married. And whenever we got married, I said there's only three things in life that are material that I long for. One is a big screen TV. Two is a scooter, a moped. Um, I know it's silly, um, but that's what I've always wanted, and I have, by the way, which is great. And three was uh, a hot tub. I wanted to have a hot tub. So we got married. We didn't have a lot of money. We're budgeting all these different things. Somebody comes to our door, and they say, we have a delivery for you. It was Toten's TV. Does anybody know if that place still exists? It's in Joliet. Uh, Toten's TV, the guy's there. He's got the truck, and he's got this great big box. And he said, we have a delivery for you, sir. And I was like, no, I, we didn't order this. And, and I, he said, well, it says Nate Ferguson. This is your address, yeah. And he said, well, I have this ticket. It's, a, it's, a, it's this big screen TV. And I saw this, this box. It was the biggest box I'd ever seen in my life. And I was like, well, that would be awesome. But we did not order that. And at that time, Rochelle tapped me on the shoulders and she said, Merry Christmas. And I was like, I married the right person. This is the greatest moment of my life. So then that next year, I thought, I got I to gotta get better at gift giving because she just raise the bar. So in that season of our life, um, we were very hectic. We had two kids below the age of two. Is anybody living that right now? Just pray for you, okay? Because that's a tough, it's a wonderful time. It's a very difficult time because you're busy. And, 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 and in my situation, at, at the church that I was serving, our parent church, everything was growing. We had like 200 high school and junior high kids, and we had the Saturday night service that was blowing up, and we had all these other responsibilities. And I just couldn't get away from it. I was a workaholic, my fault, not anybody else's mine. And I had to learn that lesson and, and have tried to get over that. But I was gone five nights a week. We did not have any time. She was teaching at the time, and we just had a hard time spending time together. So the next year for Christmas, I got her a great big box. It wasn't as big as the TV, but it was a great big box. And inside of it was literally an eight and a half by 11 sheet paper. And on it read these words. 
I've reserved, and I had the specific dates, on my calendar. I am not working those days. Your parents are watching our children on those days. And you can pick anywhere in the world you want to go, and I will pay for it, and we will have a wonderful time. Now, how about a little bit of applause? I thought that was a pretty good gift. (laughs) Nobody cares. First service was like, her gifts was better. I thought it was a good gift. She thought it was a great gift. That's the only thing that matters. And and we've never had anything that good since. It's just kind of like... That was it. We, we, we topped it, you know, 26. Um, good news, great joy for all the people. This is the greatest gift. And it's not just a one-time event. It's not just a, I'm never going to top that again. This is an all-time event at any point in your life when you understand these great gifts. Verse 11, this is it. The three gifts that God gives us are simply these things. And again, read the words that are bolded on the screen. Today in the town of David, A has been born to you. He is the? The? The uh, the kids are doing a great job. Thank you so much. I could think of so many better ways to announce Jesus' arrival. Um, I was thinking about this. I was traveling a couple of weeks ago. I was in the Southwest. That'll be a little bit of a clue for you. And I'll put this image on the screen to see if you can figure out where I was. Does anybody know where that is? It's a football stadium. There's no grass there because it sits outside and they wheel it in for the game. Does anybody know? Does that help you? Phoenix, Arizona, that's where the Arizona Cardinals play. Does anybody know what those chairs represent in the middle there? That's the broadcast booth. Uh, You might remember that in February of this year, the Super Bowl was at that stadium. And there was a gazillion people watching it, and that's the national TV broadcast booth. It's the best two seats in the house. That would have been a good place to announce Jesus' birth, because you got everybody watching and the whole world's, you know, all this stuff. That seemed like a good place. I'll make an easier one for you. How about the next slide? Where's that? That's the United States Capitol or Congress. Um, we used to, we haven't done it as much lately. I had a friend who was in a serving and um, we'd go out there and we'd pray. We'd just fly out and fly out late at night, get up the next morning, and we'd pray with peace people all throughout the day. Need to go back and do that, even though he's, this gentleman's not serving anymore. We made a lot of friends. We'd just pray over people, ask them what we could pray about. We had this great experience. But that's a powerful place. Um, those steps in front of you are in the screen. That's where the presidents are inaugurated. It's, it's a special place. It's a neat place. It's a place that represents so much. That would have been a good place to announce. But instead, on a hillside, just outside of Bethlehem, they announce these words. Again, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So let's talk about Savior just for a second. Savior is, as soon as we sin, one time, it just takes one time. Once we have sin in our life, we are separated from God. If you take magnets and you take the positive and the negative, they snap right together. It's a beautiful thing. But if you turn it and you have the positive and the positive and you try to push them together, what happens? They, they, they don't, they, there's a force field there and it repels each other. No matter how hard, hard you try and push, you're not going to make that go, go together. That's what happens when we sin. We are separated from God. He is a holy God that is perfect and he cannot be around sin. So that's the whole point of Jesus is he came to take that away Nothing that we could do. You can't do enough good deeds. You can't give enough presents this time of year. You can't say enough prayers this time of year. You can't uh, sing enough songs this time of year to overcome our sin problem. We need a Savior. Um, Many, many years ago, uh, exactly 1992, I was working as a part-time youth minister um, at a church. I had a car that I'd paid $2,000 for, and it didn't run great, but it did run, and it did get me from point A to point B. And um, I had $50 in my checking account. Remember those days when you just had $50 in your checking account and that was it? Um, We went to a family wedding, and on the way back from the the wedding, my car broke down. Um, Just outside of Quincy, Illinois, uh, these guys picked us up. They got a tow. The tow was $100. That's $50 more than what I had in my account. They took it to our local um, auto shop. We knew the people, and they were like, Nate, your timing belt or timing chain broke 
and that caused your entire engine to be a problem and they're going to have to replace the whole thing. It's only going to cost $1,100. I didn't have $1,100. And the money that I was receiving to be the part-time youth person depended on me having a car. And if I didn't have a car and couldn't get there, I wasn't going to be able to pay my college bill, which meant I would have had to drop out. How's that for a Merry Christmas? So I'm just feeling it in a big way, and I'm not sure, like, what are we going to do? And there was a saint, just a, a, just a wonderful, wonderful lady from our church that found out about this, and she called the body shop, and she paid the bill in full. Not just for the car to be repaired, but for the tow as well. When I called and said, just junk it, I'm going to have to pay you back, they said, don't worry, it's been covered. I'll never forget that moment. It was in that moment that I, I was like, I want to be like that someday. Jesus is like that every day. We, we don't have the capacity to overcome the sin in our life, but he came to be our savior. He came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And have you accepted that in your life? The second thing that he came to be was our Messiah. Now, Messiah is kind of an interesting word. It talked about the coming one for all these hundreds and hundreds of years. Everybody was like, is he going to come? Is he going to come? Who's going to be the Messiah? How's this all going to work out? And he finally came. God came and, you know, Emmanuel, God with us, he put on skin. And he experienced everything that we experience. Um, you know, I've just been sadly officiating a lot of funerals lately. It kind of sucks. And uh, people just passing away way too quick. And you know what? In that moment of loss, God is there as a comforter. It stinks, it's hard, it's miserable, but God has put on skin and he experienced loss and, and he cares about us. i um, been working with a lot of people in counseling lately that are really going through some difficult times. Massive betrayal of another person. And that's hard to work through. And Jesus put on skin and he was betrayed by his own friends. And he still is betrayed by you and I whenever we don't honor him. And yet he still loves us. He knows what it feels like. He knows what it, what it is to experience pain and grief and loss and struggle. And in the midst of that, he shows up. And he's there to comfort us. The other thing that he does is he makes us new. You know, the Messiah isn't just a one-time thing where he came and then that's great. When we allow Christ to be the Lord of our life, which I'm going to get to in just a little bit, he makes us new. He takes us from where we are right now into this really amazing place that we never thought possible because his love breaks through every time. And have you accepted him as your Messiah, not just your Savior? Hey, we need a lifeline here. We got it. But God, now that we've got you and you've got us, more specifically, are we going to allow you to work in and through us to overcome the most difficult things in our life? and also to become more of who you designed and created us to be. The last part is that we need to make him our Lord. Lord means leader. It means I'm going to do it your way and not my way. Your way is best, and I'm going to yield to that. Years ago, um, this wasn't for Christmas. It was the summer. I loved to play basketball. Does anybody like to play basketball? I just love to play basketball. And I, my dream was like to have a basketball goal in our driveway. So we'd saved up the money, we bought the basketball goal, and Nick Sandino, a lot of you know Nick, he teaches here, and he's just a great pastor and a great friend. Um, he said to me after I bought the kit, he said, Nate, don't try to install that on your own. You're going to screw it up. Wait until this day, and I will help you, more specifically, I will do it for you, so that the kids can have a great basketball goal. It'll be even, it'll be great. We gotta do it the right way. Now, what do you think I did with that advice? The first thing I thought was, who is he to tell me what to do? I'm 13 years older than him. I'm smarter than him. I'm wiser than him. I'm gonna do this on my own. You know, we get that way sometimes. And then I thought, I'm not waiting 
for him to get off work and have this time to be able to do this the proper way. How hard can it be? I have a master's degree. I'm smart. I got all, I'm going to do this. How do you think that went? There's three different pieces to it, and it should go one, two, and three. I did it three, one, and two. And the first one that I put together, I thought, this doesn't feel right. It's not fitting together properly. Um, here's a good idea. I'm going to get a sledgehammer out and just beat it into the thing until it finally goes. When he showed up three, and then I realized what I had done, and I had to call and say, remember what you told me not to do? I did that, and now I need you to help me undo it. I did it my way. Your, your way was much better. We do that with God sometimes. We determine our way is the better way. We're going to do it our way. And then we get things out of order, and we get things out of priority, and we're in a mess. And then we got to call him and have him be our savior again, right? And accept him as our Messiah so he can make us new and keep improving us and continue to try to place him as the Lord of our life, every single part of our life. Let's continue our story. In fact, we're going to wrap our story, and then we're going to have our takeaways. Verse 12, this will be a sign to you. Again, they're talking to the shepherds, the lowliest of people. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So there's your clue. Verse 13, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace on those on whom his favor rests. So heavenly host is kind of a it's like, what is that? Host would, would represent thousands and thousands, some would estimate hundreds of thousands of people. It was an army term. This is the host of the army meant we've got 100,000 or so many thousands and thousands of people. Heavenly host means that this was the army of God. This was the angels, a, good, a bunch of them, all on top of this hillside with lights and glory all around, praising God, singing glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to, whom, on, to those on whom his favor rests. It was the greatest birthday party you could have ever attended, right? We've attended some good ones, but that one's pretty impressive. And here's what their response was. This is so cool. Their response is so cool. Verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and, say those next three words, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So my encouragement to you today is let's go see this thing. Let's go check it out. Let's take the next however many days and let's find Jesus. And where we'll find him is we'll find him in the form of a gift. And the gift is quite simply these three things, which are our takeaways today. He's your Savior. Have you accepted him as your savior? Have you said, you know what? I can't do this on my own. I recognize that. I can't overcome the sin in my life. I need you. Have you made that decision? Have you accepted him as your Messiah? Have you decided to say, you know what? I've got some pretty heavy things that I'm dealing with. And instead of trying to deal with that on my own, I'm going to Give that to Christ who's come and experienced all those things yet was without sin. And have you surrendered your life to him as your...